So it's Dr. Jim Malley. That's right. And you're a professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of New Hampshire. Correct. Excellent. And you've specialized in research uh, regarding UV issues? Right. Public health, disinfection, uh, and uh, a lot of it on ultraviolet for uh, water and for healthcare acquired infections. Why have you concentrated on UV? Is that part of your lab at the university? That's, That's right. right. So, so my, my research, research interests early on in the 1980s were involving uh, methods to produce clean drinking water without producing chemical disinfection byproducts. So that led to some early research in uh, ultraviolet as an alternative for uh, primary disinfection. And, uh, you know, then one thing led to another. We actually started the International UV Association and uh, then that morphed into uh, basically a career in UV. Um, okay. So, and do you have a number of other engineers in your lab or is it just you? Uh, most of the rest of the lab are graduate students. Um, we have a couple of technicians. Um, so, you know, they're all engineers, no scientists. They, most of them have a bachelor's in environmental or in civil. Um, many are working on their master's and a couple on their PhD. Let's, let's talk about UV because the public probably really doesn't understand. Um, there's three frequency levels of ultraviolet. Is that correct? Um, Basically there. A, B, and C classifications. Okay, there are four ranges of ultraviolet frequencies, A, B, C, and vacuum that right. we typically work with, yeah. Okay, and so sunlight and sunscreen, as I recall, is that UVB? Uh, yeah, so the way people think about it is sunlight is primarily UVA and UVB. Um, uh, that... UVC and sunlight never gets to the earth because of the ozone layer. Right. Uh, and so uh, most people would say sunlight is roughly 95% UVA and 5% UVB, and they're not particularly germicidal. And just as a question, because I use like 100 sunblock when I'm on the beach. Sure. Yeah. Do, does that really work? Uh, most of those chemicals actually do manage to react with UVA and UVB. Um, there's always been some healthy uh, industry debate about other effects of sunscreen, chemicals in sunscreen and how they work. But I guess as far as uh, blocking the UV light that can give us erythema uh, or redness and the burn, yeah, they, they actually do work. Okay, so let's talk about UVC, which is the germicidal Correct. usage. And this has been around in hospitals, as I understand it, for a long time. That's right. And, uh, you know, you look back through the history, uh, UV for drinking water disinfection in France, uh, over 100 years old. Uh, hospitals, uh, uh, probably 30 years, 40 years. And more importantly, I would say the last 10 to 15 years, uh, healthcare acquired infections have been a big deal financially to hospitals. So it's been very active in the last 10 to 15 years. Yeah. And there's, as I understand, there's several ways of generating UVC at the right frequency. Uh, yes. These, as I read, mercury vapor lamps. And, right. So, and uh, also uh, LEDs. Yeah. And what, what, what are the other? I've got a piece of gear coming in that's a long tube, like a fluorescent tube. Yeah, most of that would be um, the industry leader by far, the benchmark for decades, and it hasn't changed much, is um, some sort of mercury vapor lamp. It could be low pressure or medium pressure, and that's the mercury vapor pressure inside the glass. So very likely what you've ordered is a low pressure mercury vapor lamp. Uh, they're the most common. They're the most cost-effective, they have the longest life, and most of them have the best UVC efficiency. 
how, do, how do you control the frequency that they generate? Yeah, basically you um, are not controlling very much at all in a typical low pressure lamp. You just basically have a 253.7 wavelength output. There are some medium pressure systems and that means the pressure inside the, the glass of mercury vapor is much higher where you can somewhat dial in the power and get a variety of frequencies or wavelengths from that. Um, but there's not a lot of control in those. The, uh, the other way people will manipulate the output frequency or the output wavelength is they will um, work on the material in the glass. They'll say they'll dope the quartz sleeve or they'll dope the quartz of the glass and uh, optically filter out certain wavelengths or frequencies. Um, but in general, we don't tune them as you might a radio or a, or a you know, gamma ray generator or an E-beam or something like that. Um, and then uh, the future everyone is looking to and hoping for is UV LEDs, or some people call them deep UV LEDs for um, lower wavelengths. Right now, they're not that commercially competitive. Um, you can get some pretty good prices on LEDs in a 270 nanometer range. Uh, we would prefer 260, 255, something like that. They're not that cost effective as yet, but there's a lot of promise there. Um, UV LEDs, if they come to a cost effective spot, would have longer lives, no mercury, and then have no geometrical limitation. They could basically be any shape we wanted to put those little um, printed circuits in, if you will. So uh, a real advance over the lamp technologies, if possible. So, so I purchased a, a little hand sanitizer for my cell phone because yeah. everybody's worried about touching your cell phone. Your cell phone touches your face 50 times a day. Right. And so obviously it's a natural carrier. So I right. bought this, this gizmo for like $70. Actually, my barber suggested it to me because they're using them. It's got two LEDs in it. You put it in, it does it for about 30, 45 seconds, and supposedly that does it. So mm -hmm. are, is this an effective way of killing the virus, or is this more smoke and mirrors? Great question. The vast majority of products on the uh, consumer market um, – you know, you see them in your Facebook stream or in your eBay or in your Instagram. Or they're rubbish. They really have uh, none of the fundamental understanding of how UV works. Um, they're usually way underpowered. They usually don't have six reflective surfaces. And usually the cell phone itself is winding up blocking whatever UV dose there would be from these LEDs. So quite often the top and the bottom of the cell phone are getting little to no disinfection at all. Um, one of the reasons that's proliferating is the, um, the UV surface or the UV air or the UV object disinfection market is basically the Wild West. It's not regulated. There's no consumer validation. There's no seal of approval from National Sanitation Foundation or Underwriters Laboratory. So it's the Wild West. Nobody's even really sure who regulates it. Is it EPA? Is it FDA? Is it Federal Trade Commission? So the device is um, often not backed up by any research and development at all. And as I say, the vast majority on the list, I have 145 on my Excel spreadsheet list. The vast majority of them are not doing the job. Why does UVC at 253.7 or 254 versus 222 nanometers, why does it kill the virus? As I understand it, it's causing lesions and pro prohibiting it from reproducing. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting, interesting question. question. Um, so, so a couple, couple of things about frequency or wavelength. So uh, the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength, the more energy. So 222 has more energy than 254, but they're both, they're both very adequate. So what we try to do is we match up the output of the lamp's wavelength or frequency with a life-sustaining biochemical that the uh, virus, the bacteria, the cyst, whatever it might be, the spore has. So the oldest research in its 1920s vintage found that UV damages DNA and RNA. 
it actually does something chemically called dimerizing the thymine or the uracil on these uh, nucleic acids. And that's probably the primary way UV actually works against the so-called pathogen. But if you look at much more elaborate research that found um, there's something more than that going on with certain viruses, then we start thinking about UV, al UV also has the ability to damage the proteins that are usually the attachment structure of the virus, the capsid, which is the thing that surrounds the virus, nucleic right. acid. And then in the case of SARS-CoV-2, there's even some theory that UV damages the lipid or fatty layer that's out there. So we definitely always default to say it damages RNA or DNA. It does it by dimerization. But there's probably other things going on also for uh, other wavelengths. So how do you test the efficacy of a frequency and whether it'll actually destroy the virus so it's not harmful to humans? Yeah, it's a very good question. And the other thing, uh, the, uh, the thing a lot of people would like to do is test it with the actual pathogen with a, with a SARS-CoV-2. There's a couple of problems with that. The first is availability of uh, biosafety level three and four facilities right. to do that. The second is with most pathogens, we can't grow their initial titer very high. We can get maybe, if we're fortunate, 10,000 per uh, milliliter, maybe 100,000. So we can't get as wide a range of disinfection as we'd like to test. So what, what's what been done for probably three decades now is uh, suitable surrogates uh, are selected. Um, we happen to use a very resistant virus called uh, MS2. It's a non-human virus, uh, easy to grow up to almost 10 to the 11th organisms per milliliter. Aerosolize it or atomize it onto the surface if we think that's the mode of contact. Uh, if it's liquid, of course, if it's ingestion, we would put it in the water. We can also put it on as a surface uh, wipe. So once you now have it on your mask or your cell phone or your car keys or whatever, we can then, you know, have a control with no UV dose. We can have a treatment with the different UV frequencies or UV durations or whatever you like to test. And then we basically look at log inactivation of the organism versus the control versus whatever variable we've been testing, wavelength, time, intensity of the light, whatever. Uh, that's probably the most standard way to do it. Uh, the protocol is pretty well codified for water and wastewater and stormwater in the EPA manuals. Um, we just transfer that to the solid phase. So when I say that most of the stuff on the market is rubbish, that's what I mean when we, when we dose a cell phone with a target organism and we put it in one of these devices and they're claiming 99.9% .9 kill of germs or 99.99% kill of virus. We put it in our devices and we do the validation and we get maybe 50%, maybe 80%, uh, sometimes less than 10%. So, you know, they just fail miserably. Well, so the question is, <clears throat> can, you know, I was looking at traveling and the problem for travelers with hotel rooms. Yes. Yeah. So if you, and I talked to a manufacturer in Florida and they're making, I think a couple feet high gizmo, just like a heater that generates both uh, ozone and uh, UV, I think at two, 254. Yeah. And they said it'll do 600 square feet in an hour. Just leave it in the room. Don't be there when it does it because of the O3, the ozone. Mm. And it'll kill the virus. And there's a level, evidently, that if, that they've reached. And they've also got sensing tabs that you can place around a room to see how much UV level there was. So does this, as a scientist, does this make sense to you? Right. So this, this has definitely been around a long time, different versions of this. Um, and as you were saying, it's the surgical suite model where you're disinfecting a surgical suite, um, particularly uh, surgical suites that are doing joint replacement, knee and hip, um, 
they're very, very worried, worried about secondary infection in those zones because now we've got titanium and no blood flow in there, so we can't fight an infection in a replaced knee or a hip. So basically what you're talking about in a more elaborate case is we do the dry cleanup that's always done, we do the wet wash or wet cleanup that's always done, and then we bring into this surgical suite or even this patient's hotel room, a uh, patient's uh, hospital room or extended to a hotel room now, and like you said, we have a whole bunch of different dosimeter badges. They look like post-it notes. Right. And we have them in the lab right now, square, circular, rectangular, triangle, you name it. And we put them in strategic locations in the room. Um, and then you, you go ahead and you dose the room with uh, the robots or the, some, some do it manually with a, they, you know, they put on their proper personal protection and they walk along with a little cart dosing the walls, the desks, the beds, whatever. Very good multiple barriers. So public health engineers are generally trained. We put in as many different barriers to the disease as we can. That way, if a couple of them break down, there's still a safety net. So dry wash, wet wash, UV dose should work extremely well. Um, there's definitely going to be some issues. So anything that is going to block the UV, anything that's in shadow, if it's a very sorbent bedspread, uh, any kind of very sorted material, the virus will get in, be shielded from UV, and then come out at different rates, you know, desorb off the bedspread or whatever. So never going to be perfect, but right now we advocate whether it be a hotel room, a hospital suite, a new classroom, that a classroom opening up after this uh, quarantine. Dry wash, wet wash, UV dosing of the surfaces is our is our you know, threefold uh, barrier to uh, COVID-19. So that's that's currently the thinking, yeah. What's a dry wash? Uh, normally people just go in with their vacuums, uh, oh, you know, see. duster, dust, vacuum, that sort of thing, you know, get the particles up. Does that work? Well, it's necessary if you're going to use UV or any chemical because these particles, this dirt is going to interfere with disinfection. So... Think of it as a necessary pre-treatment or a necessary precursor. So do the particles, are they capable of carrying the virus as a carrier? Yeah, great, great question. question. So uh, SARS-CoV-2 is actually a fairly large virus by virus standards. We call it a, a large RNA virus. It's a 0.18 micron virus um, or a 180 nanometer virus. So they like by their nature to sorb to things. They have kind of a sticky, fatty outer layer, a capsule, they call it. And so uh, it's not unusual at all to find viral particles associated with other particles, dust, lint, that sort of thing. It, it uh, definitely can occur. Uh, and it depends on how they interact, how they collide. Um, I think of myself as a professor, if I'm using an old chalkboard, which is still out there, uh, a lot of them dry erase boards too, they're pretty pretty powdery, and I decided to sneeze, well, I now associated my virus with all the chalk dust or all the dry marker eraser dust, so it's not the most common way by any means, but it's definitely a consideration. So what's the safety, if I was going to stay in a hotel room, for example, because this may affect a lot of people that choose to drive rather than yes. fly. Yes. If, if, if you want to be safe in a hotel room, if you take a portable vacuum, a handheld vacuum cleaner and some wipes, antiseptic wipes, and then leave a UV generator go for an hour, is that, you think that's safe? Well, that's a good question. You know, the, the other thing we do as public health engineers is uh, we have to somehow define safe. Um, right. And so in, in the water field for decades, we have said safe means less than one additional infection per 10,000 people consuming the water. So if we're trying to set up some risk level, let's say same risk, 10 to the minus 4, let's say 1 in 10,000. Okay. Uh, then I think if we were to put together all these different things, if we were to say that the, uh, you know, the room hasn't been occupied for several hours, the housekeeping has come in and done dry cleanup, wet wash, you know, probably dry in the 
bedspreads and the carpet and wet in the bathroom and the mirrors and the surfaces. And then you were to do one of these devices, especially if you were going to put little indicators, little dosimeter badges to make sure it was being done correctly. I think you basically started to knock your risk way down. You know, could you be incredibly unlucky? Absolutely. You can still get it. But, you know, we're getting, we're getting there a level of comfort issue. You know, how many, you know, do you fly in a plane with two engines or one engine? It's that kind of thinking, you know what I mean? But I do think uh, the, the hotel's got to do most of it because the other thing I don't encourage is most consumers are, they're not going to have the attention span. They're not going to have the knowledge uh, the patience, uh, because again, you cannot see the UV light that's doing the inactivation. You cannot see the virus. You can't smell it, can't hear it. So we have no human sense that we're going to do a good job. It's like painting with an invisible paintbrush, right? So although I do agree with some of the estimates that you read that this machine in so much time will cover so much space, it still needs to be verified. So I'd be much happier if you told me the hotel is bringing in a trained team and they're going to decon that room before the next guest moves in than if I said the actual traveler has to do it himself. Yeah, well, that's that they some may be doing it, but it's a function of money. Oh, yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's uh, what will the market bear, right? What will the traveler be willing to, to do? Uh, so, Jim... Is there, with the dosimeters, what kind of dose measurements do you know that it's effective? Is yeah, there any that's, standard? It's a, no, not even close. That's the million dollar question. And, and quite honestly, that's why it's been rather frustrating to all of us that um, somebody isn't, somebody meaning a regulatory agency isn't stepping up and saying, you need this amount of log inactivation. Because if that was said, then we can back calculate a dose. And that's what we do in the water world. But what I've been doing for surfaces that I think is defensible, um, we have a fairly resistant surrogate called MS2, as I mentioned. We know that with a dose of 100 millijoules per centimeter squared, that's our typical units for UV dose, right. we're going to get four log or 99.99% inactivation of this very resistant microbe MS2. That suffices for our drinking water. So I'm saying if we deliver 100 millijoules per centimeter squared to the surface, and we do have dosimeter badges that will re will measure that quite nicely. They're actually very good badges. I've been testing a bunch of them in my lab. Um, I'm saying deliver 100 with a little luck, you're 50 times higher than you need it to be. But again, I'm just Jim Alley. I wish this would be FDA or CDC or who somebody would come out and actually codify this, you know. So I think this company I talked to, their CEO said that they're looking like about 200, 220 millijoules. So I'm assuming that would be better. It's more energy. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. You know, when we do decon of the masks for the frontline workers, we use uh, 1,800 millijoules. So, because um, it's a uh, porous surface, a more complicated thing to disinfect. But no, if they're delivering 200 and they're really sure that they are, um, absolutely. Um, you know, because the market is the Wild West, we just have to be careful because we have devices that have been reported to the FTC because they're not UV lamps at all. Right. Uh, we have, you know, and that's true of, you know, wipes and uh, uh, hand sanitizer that has methanol. Yeah, look at, the re look at the alert that just came out. Yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, all of those consumer product markets are pretty loosely regulated. But if you've got a reputable firm that has a track record and has some uh, liability, it's not going to be here today, gone tomorrow, and they're doing it correctly, I think you're in okay shape. Um Ozone's a whole other animal. We have ozone generators in our lab as well. Um, highly reactive gas, so O3, uh, highly corrosive. Uh, you generate it whether you want to or not when you have a lot of high energy UV passing through air. 
Um, we generally have tried to avoid it only because it can have pretty dramatic effects on synthetics. Um, but certainly an extremely good killer of virus. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I, I do wonder, and of course OSHA has very tight inhalation uh, limits for ozone in indoor air. So we, uh, I'm not pushing it or declining from it, but we generally avoid ozone uh, in the home uh, air treatment world. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty strong oxidant. So Jim, would if the public buys generators that work at 222 nanometers, is that uh, that they can run all the time? Is that much safer? I'm assuming than 253. No, you know we don't. Have, that's a really good question. In fact, the International UV Association has just kind of put out a white paper asking some, you know, questions, putting on some good academic debate on this whole 222 versus 253 or 254. Um, uh, I'm going to say a couple of things that I think the literature, the peer review literature, supports. Um, but certainly, 222 is much higher probability of generating ozone than 254 based on the absorption of oxygen. Um, 222 has got some really good peer reviewed work on its uh, skin and eye with mice and with eye models, but Australian work suggests 222 still causes skin cancer, which the mice models do not suggest. Um, the Australian work used human volunteers. Um, so I think 222 has got some great stuff going for it. The Columbia University research team is top notch, but we still want to keep the dose of 222 well below the um, American Council of Government Industrial Hygienist recommendations. So. If you use 222 and you're going to be in the room with it, your exposure time is usually far less than two or three minutes, uh, and then you're over the uh, oh, really? hygiene, the uh, government hygiene dose. So I think, unfortunately, there's a lot more to do with 222. I think it's got great promise. Don't get me wrong. I think there's some really cool stuff about it, but I think when it is... Um, brought before public health experts and industrial hygienists, uh, I think um, there needs to be more research. Uh, I think whenever you're going to expose humans directly, I think we've got to give it a much more rigorous, uh, I'll call it a clinical trial. Um, but if we're talking about two different robots in a room with no humans at all, right. I do see 222 having a lot of promise. Uh, it's strong, it's effective. It will generate ozone, in my opinion, and it can be measured. But, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't want to decline. I, you know, the other thing I don't know a lot about with 222 is I don't know if krypton chloride lamps, which is what they use to generate that, are going to be very competitive and viable against the old mercury vapor. And what I mean by that is efficiency and lamp life. Um, you know, again, we just have a lot to learn. You know, UV-254 has had 100 years of experience and 222 has not. So uh, that I don't want to be anti-progress. I just also wanted to have a bit more of a track record. So if I left a 254 generator on, for example, in our lab or in my condo, does it have any health risks to me? Are you in there or no? If I, let's say I was. Yeah, I think, I think 254, undoubtedly, and we, we try to put as many warning signs on it as we can. Uh, UV, UVC in general, but UV254 has an even less tolerable dose, uh, industrial hygienist-wise, than 222 does. So it, it will tie almost immediately to damage of the skin cells. There's some debate whether it really causes cancer or not, but there's definitely damage. There's definitely change in the morphology of the cells. Uh, the damage to the cornea is, nobody's arguing with that. It definitely happens. So um, definitely UV254, and we've kind of known this for 100 years, damages uh, human tissue, and we want to avoid that. The problem, I think, is, 222 probably does also, even though the mouse models and the very good research shows that it's less damaging than 254. So, you, so 
if somebody were going to buy one of the lamps, 222 would be best in non-occupied area. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think uh, as long as we get more data on the lamps um, in terms of energy efficiency and lamp life, um, I, I could see using a UV222 in a closed setting with the door locked off. Um, but also the 254 market is well established as well. So I think no one's really taken the two of them head to head. Um, for example, there's another very common source that I haven't mentioned called the flash lamp. Uh, and they're on the market, the uh, uh, xenon flash lamps. The reason they didn't make it in the water market is their lamp life is 500 hours right. at best. And um, in the water market, if you're not at around 8,000, 10,000, 12,000 operating hours, you just don't compete very well. So I just don't know enough about krypton chloride to know if it truly could compete in terms of energy efficiency at the wall plug and in terms of how often do I have to replace my lamps. Um, if a hospital is operating and they look at that and they're, you know, they're not on the razor thin margin of profit that water is, they might be fine with that. Uh, but it'll be something that has to be tested out down the road, I think. How, how do they compete head to head? So flash lamps or strobes? Yeah, pretty much. They, they're, on, they're a little bit more of a Star Wars child uh, from the Reagan era. There's strobes in the ultraviolet range. They're a xenon lamp that you literally flash and you put out this burst of uh, polychromatic ultraviolet. I think they're using those on the subway cars in New York. Exactly. The, the one group that has uh, a Food and Drug Administration Emergency Utilization Authorization is a company called XENEX, and that is their technology. It's a xenon flash lamp robot. Okay, so last set of questions. Face masks, have you done any work with them? Yeah, that was our initial work, actually, starting in March 20th. Uh, all kinds of uh, N95s, KN95s, surgical masks, and now homemade cloth masks. Yeah. If we go back to the original patented uh, KN95s and N95s, just for a moment, they, um, they're they actually pretty fancy little devices in that they have this... Um, water hating layer, they call it the hydrophobic layer, then they have a series of um, synthetic polypropylene strands, so there's a layer that's very electrostatic, it likes to catch the very small particles of a virus, so it's charged, and then they have a comfort layer on the, uh, on the person's face, on the actual skin layer, the inner side. So they're a little elaborate, but in this um, remade yarmulke, let's say, or in any of the ones a lot of people are sewing for themselves, um, your, your hypothesis is very interesting. I don't know if anybody's truly studied it. Um, one of the things, of course, that is so vital is what's the viral load around you? Are what are you breathing in? You know, are you are you in a uh, you know nursing care facility? Are you in a meatpacking plant, which are horrible? Are you in an ICU? Or are you on the street and in a classroom and in a, you know, fairly social distance? So what's the viral load is certainly part of it. Um, lots of folks that I speak to that I give a lot of credence to their scientific strength is um, making a good argument for face shield and face mask. But then again, you start to get the, the human factor. How practical is that? Can you? Yeah, you, you don't really want to look go, like E.T. Go, walking down the street. Yeah, you know, can you really go on in normal life with a, you know, as it is, we're not big fans of personal protection and sort of a public health expert would say that's the last line of defense we would like to count on because we know we're all human and it gets hot, it gets uncomfortable, we, we inadvertently touch the outside of it so that if there wasn't anything on it, we've now got it all over our hands and so it is tough to use a mask correctly. Um, you know, the more I think about masks, the more I just think they're a nice visible warning to people that people should behave responsibly. And I'm not really sure what their technical, uh, you know, value is. is. <laughs> and so last question, face mask versus face shield. Are yeah. they, do you think they're equally effective? You know, that's a good question. I, I We've been told by uh, health and safety experts who are making the decisions that we cannot substitute one for the other. 
Um, and I am disappointed in that, to be honest, because just from a pragmatic point of view, face shields um, work much better, especially if you have to wear eyeglasses. Um, so I think if you're in an environment with a lot of aerosols, face shields are almost vital uh, to stop the, uh, you know, the spit them or whatever that's right. coming your way. Um, I, I guess, guess the, the <laughs> kind of the, the way out to be... Um, cover my bases as I'd say both. I happen to personally feel if I had to choose one or the other, I'd choose a first a face shield. But the experts are telling us in our own environmental health and safety group that we can't just wear a face shield. So a little bit on the fence about this. Um, viral load is still the key word, I think. You know, so if, if you're you yeah, it, if you're walking down the street, it's yeah. not such an issue. Is that correct? That's that's what I think, yeah. So have I missed anything in asking you what consumers should know? The thing I've been trying to also get across, because I worry about, particularly the elderly, <clears throat> too many folks are trying to sell UV as a magic solution to the problem. So I, I don't want consumers getting a false sense of security and then not social distancing, not wearing their masks, not hand washing, you know what I mean? There's no right. there's no magic UV bullet out there. There's no Darth Vader wand that's out there. So nice tool in the toolbox, but I guess my only caution is don't have it lull you into a false sense of security because it, it's just not magic. So you, it's just like in my world of locks. You want more than one layer of security. Exactly. exactly. That's, That's exactly, exactly what I would want to see. More than one layer. That's so not right. just one door lock, but alarms and what cameras and whatever the equivalent. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's, that's a perfect, perfect parallel. We would like to have, you know, a physical barrier, a light barrier, maybe an electrostatic barrier. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because right. any one of them, any one of them can be misused or break down, or we can just forget to put our mask on or something. You know. 